Hello and welcome to the November edition of the HBB TV webinar series. 195 people have registered for this session. Uh, that reflects the great interest in today's topic. And uh, we're, well, we're very, very happy that you've joined us live today um, to follow this session on what's new in the HBB TV specification, also called HBB TV 203 Explained. As you are probably aware, the HBB TV Association recently published uh, the latest uh, revision of their core specification, and that's HBB TV 203. And we're going to focus this webinar on uh, what's new in this uh, specification update. Um, as usual, uh, the presentation is followed by a Q&A and you're uh, encouraged to submit your questions using the text feature of the chat box you will find in the software to submit your questions during the presentation. They will be then uh, sent to me and I will read them out uh, to our speaker at the end. This will be around 10 to 15 minutes at the end of this session. It's a 60 minute session as usual. Um, I've already made you familiar with the topic. Now I'm going to make you familiar with our presenter. This is John Peising, uh, based in Brussels, Belgium. He's Director of Standardization at TP Vision and Vice Chair of the HPB TV Association. Hello, John. Hello. And um, hello, John. And who are, for those of you who aren't aware of TP Vision, because it's a B2B brand, TP Vision is the manufacturer of Philips branded TV sets in Europe. So now you should know. <laughs> And um, as usual, a, a quick uh, reminder that uh, the views represented in this webinar are not necessarily the views of the HPB TV Association. Um, so over to you, John, and we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ian. So... We'll share your screen and we can get started. So, Thomas in the background is going to make you the presenter. There we go. And there's your screen. Sorry for the delay. There it is. Is that coming through okay? Yeah, now it's perfectly visible. Thank you. Right. So, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this short introduction to HPV 203. So I thought I'd start with saying a bit about naming. So uh, all HPV TV specifications have an informal name and a formal name. So the informal name, as you can see on the left, and then the formal name is what happens when it's standardized by Etsy on the right. So 203 is the informal name, and it will hopefully be called TS 102796B161 uh, when it's completed the passage through Etsy. So there's three elements to 203. So the first element is errata to the previous specifications, 201 and 202. So this is basically fixing bugs in the spec. Then there's updates to existing features. So the goal for 203 was low-hanging fruit that are easy to specify and test. There's no big new features, those are all deferred to the next iteration. The critical updates are already widely supported in practice, and I'll say a bit about that. There's only one small new feature, I'll pick on that one as well. The other big theme in 203 is removing unused and replaced features. So we can't just keep adding features and not removing them. So, errata, for those who haven't met the, the word before, what are they? So basically these are fixes to bugs in the spec. They might be cosmetic, so punctuation, cross-references, styles, etc. There might be language that's unclear or hard to understand. There might be ambiguities, so something that can genuinely be interpreted in more than one way, regardless of how it's written. There might be conflicts and inconsistencies, so statements that actually say different things. 
There might be things that are hard or even impossible to implement in the real world. I'll come on to that one with a real example of it later. So HBB TV publishes more than one document for each year after release. So typically there's a sorry. So typically there's a list of changes to the specification and a version of the specifications with the ERATA integrated and the changes tracked. So all the ERATA have an issue number. So an issue number can be used to cross-reference between the two documents. And HPBTV members can use the issue number to look up the discussion in our issue tracking system. We've got two recent ERATA releases one in July and one in October. So 203 in fact started as a fork of 202 with the July 2020 errata integrated. Then the errata we found or fixed between July and October are included both in the October release of the errata and in 203. So what I'm now going to do is go through the errata, uh, give you an overview of what they are. The numbers are listed here. I don't expect you to read the numbers and follow the description unless you're interested, and that will be offline. So one area where we've had a number of issues is around the design of the HTML5 video element, which doesn't take account of media devices that use hardware to decode media. And we get a lot of small issues and corner cases. So there's four of them. Again, I'm not the numbers are there. Uh, you can look them up in the errata document if you like. There is some related work in the W3C Media and Entertainment Interest Group called Media Integration Guidelines. So if you're interested, have a look at that. And W3C members could even contribute. Another area where we had a, a number of errata was around media synchronization. So some of the requirements may be unrealistic for some implementers, so particularly AV sync timing. So the spec required plus or minus 10 milliseconds between audio and video, we've relaxed that to minus 35 to plus 50. The spec also had some requirements around uh, synchronization of subtitles to audio and video. So the tests we had assumed 40 milliseconds. The market expects frame accuracy at C plus, and that may not be achievable on some hardware full stop. The other thing we did was we had a look at the use cases around media synchronization, particularly audio via broadband and video via broadcast. And there's three issues there. And I've got a little picture for that one. So the use case for this one is basically, you've got the broadcast, which is the top two rows here, broadcast video, broadcast audio. And then for one program, you have alternate audio available via broadband. That could be other languages, it could be audio for accessibility, so audio description, clean audio. So the use case that we've been through and worked through, and this diagram is in respect together with a lot of supporting text, is basically you have a program, for example, from 7 o'clock to 7.30. So the app would start up before that, it would initialize the media synchronizer, it would uh, add the media object for the video element, the audio element here. Then out seven o'clock, uh, it would enable the alternate audio the terminal, would start the audio element playing until 7.30, then you've got the ended event, uh, and then you switch back to the broadcast. So this is an example of the use case that we work through. There's a lot of informative text explaining it, and some changes to the spec resulted. Another area, is sort of, well, there's a number of other little and smaller things. So compatibility with modern soft text input, dash, some things there, uh, and the, the future evolution and maintainability of our capabilities mechanism. That's the errata. Now looking at the updated features, one of the updated features is web standards. So if you look at 201, 202, they're all based on the 2013 selection of web standards. This is from the Open IPTV call forum called the Web Standards TV Profile. HPB TV has added a few things to that, but it's not done a systematic review before. And the web has moved on in the meantime. So 203 is based on a 2018 selection of web standards uh, from CTA Wave called the Web Media API Snapshot. 
And these are standards implemented by all desktop browsers in 2018, and that includes some not previously implemented in HPPT. You may say, why 2018? So why not 2020? Well, that's to allow time for code to be ported and optimized for constrained systems. Equally, you might say, why not 2016? One of the reasons for that is that public disclosure of security bugs in desktop browsers means shipping devices based on old browsers may be rather unwise. So in practice, though, all HPPTV 201, 202 implementations are going to be based on a browser more recent than 2014, but perhaps not as recent as 2018. Why? Well, moving to a new version of Chrome or WebKit will increase the product development cost. And also, the more somebody optimizes a port of Chrome or WebKit to 2D, the longer they're going to want to keep using it. New devices continuing to use very out-of-date browsers, though, is a major concern for some. And remember that the HTML5 engine in the TV is typically not updated, unlike Chrome or Safari in a mobile. One of the, as part of the updates to the web standards, one of the new features that comes in is the W3C media source extensions. So this is an API for media playback, widely used for web video content in the web. So the, the complex player logic is shifted from the HPDTV implementer to the JavaScript library in the app. So the app handles loading data and then uses MSE to pass it to the media decoders in the terminal. MSE can be used with Dash, it can be used with HLS, it can probably be used with any HTTP-based protocol or format that you can implement as a JavaScript library. Content to that providers can choose among a number of MSE player libraries. There's open source libraries for Dash, so Dash.js or Shaka. There's also HLS open source libraries and commercial offerings for Dash, HLS and others. Some HPVTV terminals have supported MSE for years. So there was an MSE app deployed in Germany from, in 2018 from Fraunhofer Focus. Uh, MSE is also required for the work of HPPTV targeted advertising spec. So the app can load an advert into memory and then can play it with guarantees about no pausing or no storage due to the network. So this is just from a, the HPPTV symposium two years ago. Uh, with, and you can see the first line here limits to the app was limited to new HPBTV devices with MSE through whitelisting. So even two years ago, there were enough HPBTV devices with MSE in Germany that an app that only worked on those was viable to deploy. So a bit about the key advantages of MSE. So you get a reduction in dash interrupt problems as the content and the app provider can choose a dash player known to work with their encoder packaging provider. So that's a potential saving for content map providers, their suppliers and manufacturers. JavaScript libraries can evolve as streaming media protocols evolve without needing software updates on HPVTV terminals, software updates that will probably never happen. It's consistent with the way commercial media playback is done in the web, so you get reuse of tools, libraries, apps, expertise. There are, of course, a few limitations. So some low-end terminals may be able to play UHD via the native Dash player, but not have enough processing capacity to play UHD via MSE. And using the generic web APIs to load the data, so XHR or Fetch, does bring security requirements that may not be useful with commercial media. So mixed content is one example of that. If you've got DRM encrypted content, then re-encrypting that again in TLS is not necessarily useful. You also may get some extra network traffic due to uh, the cause to security system. It's also worth noting that MSE implementations in Chrome don't support some advanced media features, and integrators don't particularly want to modify code with each release of Chrome or WebKit from upstream. So one that we hit in the spec a few times is exposing NGO, so AC4, MPEG-H, etc., pre-selections as MPEG-HTML5 audio tracks and supporting selecting between them doesn't work and isn't going to. Uh, it's also worth noting that Chrome in general doesn't support HEVC via MSE. Moving on to more updates in web standards. So we've got a few, we included some other ones that came in as part of CTA Wave. Again, they might have been there anyway. So service workers, so this one enables more responsive and more adaptable apps. We've updated the web security specifications to keep up with 
the work that's going on there. HTTP2, HTTP2 has come in. Uh, navigator cookie enabled is useful for querying if persistent cook storage of cookies and web storage is disabled. We've also updated TLS to version 1.3. So unlike the above, this one is in it's not in all 2018 browsers, but it is being rolled out quickly. Uh, so uh, you can look it up on this website called caniuse.com, which is really useful for showing what versions of web browsers support which web standards and when. So here's just a, a screenshot of caniuse.com for TLS 1.3. So you can see that it's supported in everything uh, other than uh, classic IE pretty much and Opera Mini. And you can even see which versions of what it came in at. So uh, another chunk of updated features relate to OTT streaming. And one of those is we've brought in explicitly support for this thing called CMAF. So a bit of background on CMAF first. So Dash builds on the, the ISO BMF F4, informally called MP4 file or container format. Now that's a complex spec with many options, and Dash doesn't itself define a clear profile. CMAF comes from an Apple Microsoft cooperation to switch HLS from transport stream to MP4. And the goal here is that both Dash and HLS manifests should be able to refer to the same CMAF media segments. And it started out basically as a minimum basic set of features that should work everywhere, so a lowest common denominator. We look at CMAF and HTTP2. So CMAF, the container format, is a subset or a profile of ISO BMFF. So in theory, CMAF content should just work on HTTP2. It seems impossible to prove it, but I've asked many times and nobody could think of anything that isn't already effectively required for Bash. Where you might need to be a tiny bit careful is that CMAF also defines codec profiles, and there could be issues here if the content would use unusual picture aspect ratios or resolutions, as DVB dash is more constrained and this sort of more weird or unusual stuff may not have been tested. The dash IF validator can also be used to validate CMAF compatibility as well as DVB dash compatibility. Another feature or, or another update that comes into OTT streaming is low latency live or linear services, which is very fashionable now. Uh, but it's also quite complex. Uh, there's several parts to it and several options for doing it. So one part is startup delay, so the time until uh, the media is visible or audible. And that's applicable to all linear stock content, even if the actual content itself is not live. Also in the relevant is catching up and closely following the live edge. So this is most applicable to genuinely live content. So the, step, the best example here is if you think of people watching a football match, then they want to see the goal on TV before they start seeing tweets about it. And for this one, a player might fall behind or it might start behind the live edge. So you, the player has got to be able to catch up with the live edge. Now there's two obvious options for how to do low latency. Uh, they're in DVD dash. One is small segments, so perhaps reducing the segment size from four seconds or eight seconds to one second. Now in practice that should work everywhere, but it does bring bandwidth and CDN overhead because each segment has to start with an iframe. The other option is chunked content, which is also uh, more, also potentially referred to as multiple move end app boxes per dash segment. So, here, the beginning of a dash segment can be downloaded before the end has been encoded, or potentially before the end even exists. Now, in theory, this should work everywhere, but it may not work on all the devices. Testing would be required. HPBTV203 supports low latency via MSE. The native dash player should support both options for low latency content, in if you like a backwards compatibility mode, but it's not required to catch up and follow the live edge. So if you want to test um, low latency, chunking, multiple move and that, uh, whatever you want to call it, the hbbtv drm reference app has this included. Uh, the URL is here if it's, uh, if it's new to you. But basically, if you, from the home screen, it will come up like I'm showing here, no DRM. And even on a PC, you can use cursor keys to go down twice and then across to get to item 1.8. 
the multiple may send that. Uh, we also, in the dash DRM reference map, uh, have support uh, live. So this uses dash AF live sim. So you need to go use uh, the right cursor keys or right on the remote to scroll the top menu across to live and then down to the items that you can see here. So 5.1, multiple move end up, and it's just, that's regular, you know, unencrypted, and then 5.2 is the same with Play Ready, and 5.3 is the same with Marlin. The last part of the OTT streaming update that I'm going to talk about is querying support for CBCS encryption. So the OTT industry is moving to adopt Apple's flavor of the AAS encryption system, uh, CBCS instead of sync as it was more previously used. Widevine already moved, and PlayReady 4 supports the Apple flavor of CBCS. And CBCS is one element of enabling content to be encoded, packaged, and encrypted once for multiple different devices. So CMAF is another part of it. And obviously, though, as I mentioned, you do need to be a little bit careful with codecs and resolutions. But if you stay with AVC and HEAAC and the usual resolutions, uh, then that should just work. Um, HPBTV 203 allows apps to query which AEC encryption modes are supported. I mentioned there was one new feature. Uh, this one is querying the physical screen size. So this is an extension to the HPBTV XML capabilities mechanism. Uh, I just copied the spec out, the bit of the spec out here. So basically, the app can query the, the width and height of the screen in centimeters. So if you've got a, a really big screen, the app can adapt its UI uh, based on a huge screen size compared to a medium screen size. Now, the third set of features I mentioned are unused and replaced features. So this basically what we've done is a spring cleaning of features that are not used in the real world or that have been replaced. Some features have got removed immediately. I've got a list of those in a moment. Uh, mostly they've gone completely, although we moved one of them to the op app spec. Some features are at risk. Uh, the term here would be deprecated. They could be at risk of being moved to the op app spec. They could be at risk of being removed in the next specification release or at risk of being removed in the further future. So if we look at the features already removed, and remember these are all features not used in the real world, as far as we can tell anyway. So CI plus host player mode. So that one basically is where the dash player in the 2D or the top box uses a DRM system in a separate hardware module, be it USB or PCMCIA for CI plus. Another one is the HPB TV app launching an app on a phone. And this is removed in that direction only. So the design relied on TV set top box manufacturers including support for it in a mobile app that consumers would then install. In the real world, the larger manufacturers didn't include this in their apps. Um, the smaller ones never had apps in the first place. Now, just to be clear, uh, the, a mobile app launching an app on a TV or set-top box in the opposite direction remains mandatory. So it's only one part of the, the companion screen story that's been removed. Teletext subtitles in OTT content has been removed. Uh, this seemed logical to, in 2009, so 10 years ago, and there wasn't a lot else for subtitles at the time. We thought we had to include something, but it's never been used in the real time world. Uh, we've removed three bits of MediaSync that aren't used. So the use of the AV control object in MediaSync, uh, that's redundant with respect to the, the HTML5 video element. Why would we add functionality to this 10 year old API? Uh, the media sync tests in the test suite that use the AV control object are being reworked or dropped. There are two never implemented options in media sync as well. Uh, sync slave mode is gone and sync buffer is gone. What we move to the op app spec is the other part of CI, uh, so another part of CI, which is the SICAM player mode. So in this mode, the media player and the DRM system are both moved into the separate hardware module. Again, never know, not known to be implemented in the world. Uh, not, neither of them are supported uh, for testing and certification of CI plus implementations. 
Now looking at what's at risk. So we've got the candidate to move to the op app spec, which is Pushrod and the Download Manager. So these were invented mainly for satellite and to enable Pushrod to uh, markets where the broadband wasn't very good. So for example, North Africa. They've never been deployed in the real world. They were implemented in some prototypes. Uh, and if you wanted to use these with a TV set, then the consumer would need to plug in USB storage. So, and consumers don't do that without a good reason backed by a marketing campaign. So they might be usable in, a, in PVRs uh, with fewer obstacles though. So as I said, there's some prototypes have been shown, uh, but yeah. We will, in the next re requirement cycle, we will reconsider local PVR. So, I mean, catch up is moving online and OTT. Uh, local PVR has been implemented. Uh, some HPDTV terminals actually implement it fully. Some just implement the subset relevant to time shift. So, pause live TV if you like. We've got test cases for this, but were never reviewed, and volunteers would be needed to review them. So, if you think local PVR is interesting to you and important to you, uh, please think about finding a way to help review the test cases, because that will actually be seen as a sign that this is important and should be kept. We've got one feature that depends on privacy considerations, which is file system acceleration. And the HPBTV Privacy Task Force will evaluate if this is still needed uh, based on how the, the overall privacy landscape evolves and has evolved. We've got some candidates to be removed at some time in the future. So the AV control object has been replaced by the HTML5 video element, and all DRM agent has been replaced by encrypted media extensions. But both of these are used by a lot of apps today. I mean, manufacturers, some manufacturers were we're shipping HTML, HBDTV 1.5 until very recently. Apps that want to reach the largest possible amount of the install base need to use these and only use these. So uh, plenty of notice will need to be given. It, it may be possible to replace the AV control object with something that the web calls a polyfill if there's sufficient interest. But we are going to, we're going to stop adding new functionality to the AV control object, and this was what was behind removing the media sync functionality that I mentioned earlier. So that's the spec. I'm now going to move on a bit and talk about testing of 203. So we've got up to potentially 80 odd new test cases for 203, 35 ish for MSE, and there's also some of the tests for MSE and the targeted advertising spec that will become mandatory for 203. 18 odd new tests for DVB Dash, those are also applicable to 201, 202. 14 odd others are applicable to 203. 16 odd errata ones, so particularly related to the multi stream sync accessibility use case where I showed you the diagram earlier. All of these should be included in the July 2021 test suite release, which is the official one from HBDTV that's targeting 2022 products. And hopefully, early access versions can be included in the March 2021 test suite release. So that's the, the, the regular stuff. But what about web standards? So historically, HPBTV has a test of these. We have a sort of vague hope to include a small sample of the W3C web platform tests to confirm that recent APIs were implemented at all. But it never got up to be a high enough priority to actually happen. Uh, now, the CTA WAVE project has done a lot of work to make the W3C web platform tests more suitable for smart TVs. Uh, here's a couple of references for it. Uh, details here are still to be worked out, uh, but particularly also given MSE uh, and the updates, things like uh, service workers, there is going to be an attempt to have a look at this again. Now, that's 203. You can't spend a long time talking about 203 without saying something about what's next. So we have just finalized some requirements for what comes next. And I've got a few examples here. So one of them is accessibility. 
So coexistence of HPPTV apps with accessibility features offered by the TV or set-top box. So examples like a screen magnifier, feedback on user interaction, so when the user presses keys on the remote control, high contrast UI, uh, dialogue enhancement for advanced audio. So HPPTV is not going to make any of these mandatory, just it's what it's going to do is permit apps to discover with what's supported, uh, to work with it, and to avoid conflicts. And this is partly looking forward to the implementation of the European Accessibility Act in 2022 to 2025. Something that appears in a number of devices now is voice assistance. So what we want to avoid is somebody who's been using voice input with the native UI of the TV or set-top box suddenly having to switch back to a classic remote control for HPDTV app. So we're going to look at the coexistence of HPDTV apps with voice assistance. Another thing that we've got a new requirement for is support for HPDTV red button apps on DVBI services. So live linear services streaming OTT. Since I started the presentation with something about naming, uh, will this next version be called 204? Well, that's what we're calling it internally, but there's no decision on the informal line yet. So, I, I couldn't say for, go on without sort of highlighting some opportunities for people who want to contribute, and contributions are always welcome. So, HPVTV 204, uh, or whatever we call it. Uh, so, well, I gave you a list of the features on the previous slide. Uh, help with Alexa or Google Assistant is particularly welcome, uh, but in general with any of those, if you're interested in an HPVTV member, please help with writing those. First call on those is later today. The unit tests for 203 and the errata to 201, 202. So, as I said, we hope to have early access versions of the unit tests from February, March onwards. Uh, running those would be really helpful. Uh, we, we only get a good quality set of tests if people actually run them. Anybody can contribute to fill, can con contribute unit tests to fill gaps. We have a process for that called unplanned submissions. Uh, we have expertise on W3C web platform tests to help them include them in HPVTV would be really welcome. Another area where we welcome contributions is reporting real world interoperability problems. So, particularly something that you can reproduce on TVs and set top boxes from multiple manufacturers, ideally 2020 models. I mentioned the Dash DRM reference app. If there's something you think should be added uh, that's relevant, please do something interesting, uh, fork it, add it, and then contribute it back. I mentioned the long term goal to uh, deprecate the old AV object. Uh, if you're interested in using that, then help with creating a web polyfill is an ideal opportunity to contribute. We have the, a design document uh, for this, uh, but not enough interest to actually help writing the code and debugging it. And some of these require HPBTV membership, but not all of them. So, there we are. Uh, sorry for the gallop through a dense uh, amount of information, but the slides will be available, the video will be available, and we've got a reasonable amount of time for Q&A. So thank you very much for that. Thank you for listening. That's right. Thank you very much, John, for this great update on 203. And uh, I think what we've all learned is that uh, the uh, HPB TV standard is not something that's fixed, that's there, and then you know people see how they're going with it. It's something that keeps evolving, something that keeps changing, adjusting on a, to the market needs, market requirements, and it lives from, and that's what John said in the last slide, the participation and the contribution, the engagement by market players. Uh, it's not just a standard that um, provides interactivity, adds interactivity to television. It's a standard that lives from interactivity, and that means from you. And that leads me to the Q&A section. That's an important part of every 
webinar of the HPP TV webinar series, and I can see the first questions already coming in. Um, Thomas, in the background, please uh, make me turn me into the moderator so I can share my screen. There we go. And as usual, so that you can all see um, what we're talking about, I am uh, sharing the uh, list of questions that you can see here now. Okay, I'll just very quickly open another file so that you can all see the same image. Here we go. Um, questions by participants. Um, the very first question that has come in um, concerns uh, uh, the, the community of app developers. As an app developer, is it easy to support both the AV control object and HTML video, John? Uh, easy is a subjective term. I mean, you would end up uh, needing some form of abstraction uh, um, or uh, perhaps help contribute to a polyfill so that somebody can, we can have something that looks like the AV control object but actually translates that API into what can be supported by the HTML5 video element. Okay. Um, the next question is, HBB TV will follow 208's browser standard and maybe it will also include the web assembly feature called uh, the WASM, which was unlocked in browser since 2017. Um, this will help to handle secured multi-platform binary code for x86 or ARM platforms and is also enabling multi-threads and CPU multi-core usage, for example, it will bring the decoding and of new web P Google or HEIF Apple or HVIF a V1 codec image formats. It might help to have more game engines on HPV TV platforms like Unreal or Unity engines that have already migrated to WASM. More of a standard and a question, but John, what's your comment on that? Uh, it's it, well, it may be there in some implementations, depending on what browser they're based on, uh, but it's not a required feature within the spec. So yep. conceivably, uh, you can do the, I mean, I gave the example earlier of a 2018 app uh, that used MSE uh, because the, the developers had tested the devices in the market and found that there were enough of them supporting MSE that it was viable to use it. Uh, somebody wants to use WASM, uh, then uh, they would need to, to basically test some devices, and if it works in enough devices, uh, then make a whitelist and go and use it. Or bring it along to the HPVTV requirements group as a feature for the next one. Okay. Um, let me see the next question. I typed it in here. Um, yeah, there you go. Um, will it be? Will there be an interoperability workshop in 2021 without IIT? Of course, maybe with a few words on IIT. The background, John. Uh, so, for those who don't know, uh, IIT was uh, funded by a, a collection, a consortium of German-speaking broadcasters, and uh, one of them uh, pulled the plug on the funding and attempts to organize funding amongst the remainder have failed. Uh, so IRT uh, very sadly uh, closes down at the end of this year. Uh, yeah. There are others who have organized uh, introp workshops. And there was at least one other who had volunteered uh, to organize an introp workshop in 2021. So if, tr if travel resumes, uh, later in 2021, when people are able to travel, uh, then uh, I'm fairly confident that we will be able to find room for at least one intro workshop later in 2021. And Even without we've, IRT? We've had, one at UK, we've had one at UK DTG in London before, and there was okay. there are there have been some country-specific intro workshops as well, and at least one host of those also volunteered to host something. Okay. 
Um, next question, what is motivating the removal of OIPFD RMA agent in the future? Uh, it's redundant with respect to EME. Okay. Okay, any more questions? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, as I've said earlier, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the industry keeps moving on and changing and it's, it's just so fast and um, with devices being uh, exchanged, swap removed, um, there's always kind of new levels coming in that need to be uh, considered and, and that of course triggers these kind of changes and the most important thing is obviously the market needs and if there's no market need for something or the market has changed then obviously this needs to be reflected by the standard. I mean HVBTV is not attempting to follow the bleeding edge of the web uh, and we're yeah. uh, but equally uh, once the web has moved on you can't keep ignoring it in ad infinitum, and MSE and EME have both been around in the web for quite some time. Yeah. Any more questions coming in? Um, there's a bit of time left. Uh, please use the uh, chat box that you can see in the webinar software. Just type that in, and uh, John will do his best to respond. This is a one-time opportunity to open a question to one of the experts on the HPV TV standard. And I was just saying, it, or thinking, it doesn't just have to refer to 203. Uh, we can talk about anything HPV TV related, obviously. There's a question that has come in. Is the HTML5 video API more mature than AV control object? Uh, I would say they're both mature. I mean, the AV, mm -hmm. the AV, the HTML5 video API has been around since what, 2012, 2013, something like that. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, we've got time. Do you want to make me presenter, and I will just we can just. I think that's time. Yeah, uh, Thomas, please, if you yeah, turn you uh, John presenter? into the presenter, so you can say. Do you want to share the screen? Okay. Um, yeah, then this should be possible now. Yeah, there we go. So, since I mentioned... See, John's prepared for these kind of questions. <laughs> and the good thing is we have a bit of time left. So please do uh, keep submitting your questions. There is, uh, let's see, about 15 minutes left still. So quite some time. Uh, Anything HPB TV related, um, don't hesitate. Now is the time to ask. Okay. Are you seeing uh, Chrome and can I use? Um, we can't see your screen at the moment. Okay. I wasn't sure about. Just give me a moment. There is now your screen is back. I've just received another question. It's a bit of a longer one. I'll quickly go through it before submitting it or forwarding it to John. Okay. Video element. So I mentioned can I use? So uh this was so I went to caniuse.com, searched for the video element. So you can see here that Edge supported the video element from 2015 onwards. So if you just hover over these, Firefox from 2013 onwards, Chrome from 2010 onwards, but then Google were one of those involved in driving it, and Safari from 2017 onwards. So the question is asked how mature is the video element? Well, it's been supported yep. in desktop browsers for quite a long time. Okay. Right. That was. Uh, you can 
and right. uh, thanks thomas you can uh, make me presenter again so i can show my screen because there is another question that i've just received meanwhile i'll read it out to you there we go share my screen so i can see it all what we're now talking about this is the last question in this list since mse is supported is it is the native hbb tv dvb dash player the only choice or javascript based will be an alternative in the future okay then i i apologize for not being clear enough but absolutely javascript is an alternative you can choose either of them if you're if you want if you're targeting if there's a big enough pool of devices with mse then absolutely you can use uh, dash.js or Shaka or uh, those. That was why I had the slide listing them. And I apologize for not being clear enough. Okay, a uh, new question has just come in. Uh, do you have an, uh, any idea, um, oops, it's disappeared. Any idea to maintain compatibility for app between 203 and pre-203 environments? The question sort of presupposes that there's a huge difference between them, and there isn't. So, I mean, if you stick to, because the most of the features that are in 203 are actually supported uh, in uh, previous implementations. Uh, and so it's not a binary choice. It's a sort of, it's a spectrum. I mean, if you want to, you get a different answer. If you want to maintain compatibility with a 2014 HVB TV 1.5 device and a 2020 HVB TV device, so across six, seven years worth of products, then you're going to have to be really careful. Uh, you're going to have a, probably have to stick to HVB TV 1.5 features, or at least make an app that uh, does feature detection and only use and where use of anything beyond HPBTV 1.5 is optional or implemented in JavaScript. You're also going to, if you want to use the older devices that far back, you're going to have to be really, really careful about how much memory you use uh, because the newer devices probably may have more memory or more efficient memory usage than the older ones. So there's a pretty severe risk of falling out of memory. It's not just the APIs. Yes, this is quite some important aspect and uh, helpful uh, advice, I think, uh, for these kinds of um, questions. Um, a new one has arrived. In certain countries, HPB TV 201 is mandated by respective CPE regulations. Would it freeze the HPB TV deployments in the 201 phase? Please comment and share your opinion on 203 practical rollout important of course uh, we've just been talking about something that's in theory still so my understanding is that, that if you read the small print uh, what's mandated is 201 or later not explicitly ah, right. 201 that's which is important. a subtle difference but you do have to read the small print uh, yeah. and so in other words Basically, in those countries, what you weren't allowed to do is to continue shipping HPB TV 1.5. Yeah. So there are already manufacturers shipping HPB TV 202. Yeah. So if there was somewhere that actually did explicitly mandate 201 it, exactly and nothing later, uh, then a manufacturer wouldn't be able to ship 202 when there are some. So I don't yeah. believe anything is frozen in 201. Uh, 203 practical rollout. Uh, HPB TV's goal is to enable, is to provide the test suite uh, in the July 2021 release in time for manufacturers to implement it in 2022. Now, as I said in practice, the browser update uh, is probably there already. CMF is probably there already. Uh, MSE may be there already. Uh, actually, the bigger parts, of, the more challenging parts, may be getting the uh, errata up to date. So, uh, 
there's no real reason why not to support the new stuff. You may be doing the devices may be doing it already. Yeah. All right, uh, one last one. Uh, personally, I did not catch the answer about why removing the OIPF DRM agent and what will replace it because the date is used in some op app work to access the CAM. Right, the reason to replace it is to replace it for DRM use cases. So PlayReady, Marlin, Widevine, etc. Because there it is redundant with respect to EME. Uh, for the CAM use case, it will have to be retained. Okay. So it wouldn't, um, it last, wouldn't be used to yeah. Last opportunity for questions. Otherwise, I will wrap it up by letting you know uh, the details on the forthcoming webinars. Okay, the last question has appeared. I'll quickly copy that into our overview. Here we go. Can uh, TV sets be upgraded or updated? Uh, can they upgrade or update their HPB TV versions? How will it be? What should viewers do? So how, how is this done? Is it possible to have a TV set, the hardware, and update the HPB TV version without replacing the hardware? And how is it done? And what's your advice to viewers? Quite interesting, I think. Uh, this one we come across many, many times. Uh, yeah. The answer is it's possible in theory, uh, but uh, the, uh, the market structure uh, basically doesn't support it. So the business models aren't there to provide a, some kind of revenue flow back to the TV manufacturers to fund the cost of doing that update. So yes, it's possible in theory. Uh, you may get updates to fix major bugs, but typically they will retain the same HPV TV version and it's just a bug fix. Uh, so uh, upgrades, updates to the HPV TV version simply don't happen in the real world. And what should yeah, do there's... viewers? Uh, nothing viewers can do. Uh, the, it's up to the app developers and the, the broadcasters, if they're buying apps in, uh, to decide what minimum version of HPBTV they want to target, and uh, to manage that with the and manage their communication to the viewers in their market accordingly. But would it be possible for a viewer who's very technically minded, maybe an engineer, to upgrade the HPBTV version on his or her yeah. TV set without the manufacturer being involved? No. Nope. Okay. Um, so there's one second. Customized yeah, integration please, right. with the browser. All right. That explains HPV it because HPV. that's yeah, that's the difference then between what technically possible or in theory possible and then the market reality and the commercial side, of course, that you mentioned. Next question. If one uses a JS player, which is now possible with HPB TV, they may thus not use DVB dash. Is that the case? That's correct. If there's enough devices with MSE in your market, then yes, you're not required to use DVB dash. Okay. But if you want to reach the older devices uh, or you want to reach all of them, then uh, yes, you will need to. Okay. One more question. How stable is the two or three test suite expected between June? I mean, uh, I think it's probably meant how, 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 yeah, how, how's the likelihood of this to be released in June next year? Uh, so the, uh, the likelihood of it being, so I think we are very much hoping to have a very large proportion of it in time for the early access in the January, February, March uh, test suite release. Uh, how stable it is by June depends on how many people run it. Yeah. Okay, let's see if we can do the final questions. Um, now, 
here is the first one. We have experienced some problems with devices blocking HRI, uh, HAR requests to domains that are not in the application boundary descriptor. Is the application boundary descriptor meant to be a constraint to original HAR requests or should it use the CORS headers as usual in or on the web? Uh, the second of those, it's not a constraint. Okay. And uh, the very last question, um, whether the latest HPB TV 203 test suite will cover the test that the cases for HTTP 2 and TLS 1.3 related tests? Yes, to a limited extent. Okay. Thank you very much for your questions and a very interesting um, involvement by our participants today. And uh, I'm happy to be able to announce the next webinars of this series. You can see here, uh, the next one has already been scheduled. You'll receive an invitation very shortly. Um, on December 3rd, it's uh, between 3 and 4 p.m. European time. And uh, there's a webinar on, um, Oh, let me see, here it is. There's a webinar on uh, interactive TV services and innovative use cases with FinCons Group and uh, Mediaset. And it contains both the European market and the uh, US market. And uh, then next year, you can see already lots of um, uh, topics and uh, first uh, preliminary dates uh, listed for the next uh, webinar. Uh, sessions of the HPB TV webinar series. And uh, as usual, if you'd like to contribute, um, we are very happy uh, to receive your suggestions for this webinar series. Uh, there's the email address you can see here. Uh, this also affects any questions you have regarding today's webinar, uh, past webinars, or webinars scheduled in the series. Um, as usual, there is a survey coming up at the end of this webinar, so please don't close the window when we've said goodbye, because uh, if you uh, submit your responses, we will use them to improve this webinar series very briefly. So stay with us, and uh, I want to use this opportunity to say thanks to John for this great presentation and uh, a very detailed Q&A, and uh, thanks to you for uh, watching this session live. As usual, there will be the recording up on YouTube very shortly, and the pre presentation will be available as a PDF download uh, as well very shortly. See you next time. Have a good time, and bye-bye.